and I'm else. and I'm happy that I'm here with you. Yeah, you yeah. are. Yeah. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. And, and uh, I have actually, I mean, always when when we can make an interview like this, yeah. you have to come up with some really nice questions and everything. Yeah. So, are you ready to start? I'm ready to start. I'm totally into it. Perfect. So, first question I have to ask you: Yeah. If if you could choose to be any color that you want, which color would you would you want to be? You can choose any color you want. C color. Color, yeah, color, like a color, like blue, for example, red. Uh, I thought this was uh, a serious uh, interview. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But uh, that that's not that's not ser that's 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 a children question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think maybe we should leave it like this. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, hope to never yeah. see you again. Copenhagen, the hometown of legendary rock band DAD, or Disneyland After Dark as they were once called. We're here to meet up with lead singer and rock veteran Jesper Binzer to pick his brain and talk about the history, the present and the future of rock and roll. Sharing here in or outside Copenhagen, I'm not really sure. This is not my hometown, but we're we're basically in Copenhagen, right? Yeah, we are in an old shipyard. It's called BMW. This is a place, believe it or not, my grandpa worked out here. And he, the grandpa, he, we're talking the grandpa of Mr. Jesper Binzer from DAD. The grandpa welcome. of Danish Rock. Yeah, the grandpa of Danish Rock. <laughs> <coughs> so <laughs> this is this is actually the room or the studio or the you know. The, place the, the, the future has been made here for maybe five, six, six, seven years, I think. This is the most holy ground of DAD. This is our safe space. This is where we compose. This is where we rehearse for, for, for shows, for tours, but also where we compose our music. So this is really, uh, you know, the holy, the holy place. And you have been rehearsing today, right? That's right. The guys were here. We've been uh, shouting and uh, screaming and banging. And how often, how often do you meet here? Every day of the week. Every day? So Every this, day. Is, this is kind of your job. It, it, it seems, it feels <laughs> like, and it's like, but it is. It's our lives. But the thing is that, of course, it's like uh, project orientated. So yeah. we're about to make songs for a new album. So, um, yeah, so we try, you know, we book ourselves into here for like a couple of months, make some songs, go demo the songs. Okay. And then come back here a couple of months, demo the songs. We, so we just make up like 40 songs. 40? As we, yeah, as you know, you need, you need to have 10 on the album, but, but 40 songs will like, then there's some good ones okay. in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but what, so you, when you meet here, you're, you're playing new songs. It's not like you're playing Laugh and a Half. Oh, no, 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 no. God forbid. Business. God forbid. No. Yeah. You know those already. We know those already, and then those are in the past. Those are in the past, yeah. but still in the present. Oh yeah, of course. People love them, and, and 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 we love to play them live. Yeah. But there's no need for us to play them here. How long do you think you could not play, for example, Bad Craziness, and then just go up on stage and play it and not miss a single note? How how long? If we take like one year, two years, five years, ten years. Yeah, so some, years. some of the songs we could easily uh, uh, not do them for uh, a handful of years, definitely. Yeah. And I think that the Slimmer Day Away and Bad Craziness and It's After Dark are songs that isn't played here. So, I mean, sometimes six months yeah. uh, <laughs> before we, we, we play them live again. Yeah. Well, so uh, for, for the viewers of Tell Us Rock Now, obviously there are there is a new record coming. Yeah, yeah, it's slowly coming. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> in uh, 2024, this band turns 40 years old. <laughs> so there's a, a jubilee going on. There's a big anniversary. There's a big whoa, whoa, whoa. So we want to have that album ready for, for the 40th. So in 24, this album, what we're doing now will be out in 24. And there will be a huge tour and everything. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, all, and also there'll be uh, all kinds of very, very funny activities. Yeah. 
Yeah, just you wait and see. Ah, uh, well, we will. Trust me, uh, definitely. Um, I mean, the band GAD or Disneyland After Dark, as it was, uh, you started it in 1982. Mm -hmm. You were 17 years old. Yeah. What was life like at that time? I mean, tell us about the beginning, please. Um, Jacob hadn't joined the band yet, hence the discrepancy between 82 and 84 as counting the years. So in 82, me, Steve, and uh, a guy called Peter met up. We knew a lot of each other from the local skateboard scene. So we've been, we've been skateboarders uh, together for, for a long time before we started to play music. And that whole skateboard thing, it was at that point, at least in Denmark, it felt very outlaw. It was actually not allowed to, to ride a skateboard on the streets in Copenhagen in the 80s. So we felt like outlaws, we dressed like outlaws, and we played outlaw music, punk rock. Mm -hmm. And that was what, how we met and how we did it. And we, we got together in you know, the local uh, youth clubs and, uh, you know, try to hustle the rehearsal space and try to, to borrow some of the instruments. And it was like, let's play some punk rock. And we played some punk rock. And at one point, no, no, we need to play. Uh, we need to be a, a techno band. Techno band? Yeah, we said, no, no, we need to be a techno band. There's a, there's a, there's a front 242 and there's a suicide from, from New York and, and there's a, Deutsche Mechanische Freundschaft. Yes, that's what we want to do. Let's do something different. Okay, yes, okay. <clears throat> so so the, <laughs> the whole idea with the AD was, we, we, okay, let's make some di industrial disco techno. So, um, and this is a true story. There's a very, very good song uh, by um, Suicide, Alan Vega, uh, and Martin Rev called uh, Ghost Rider. And Ghost Rider goes like... <laughs> Or maybe it's Johnny Teardrop, or whatever. It's one of those the good songs from Suicide. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, oh, Johnny, Johnny. <laughs> That's what we want to play. And then we started, and then Steve took the bass and he played. He was supposed to play, but he played. And right there, all plans out down the drain. Let's play country punk. Let's play. Country and Western punk. So uh, that's how uh, the whole DAD thing started. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's an amazing story. Yeah. So starting from, you know, we play punk rock to trying to play some kind of yeah. industrial thing, yeah. ending up with some. Yeah. That, and that country. song turned out to be Trog, which was on the first album. Uh -huh. And from then on, we, yeah, we spent, I don't know, two or three years with cowboy hats and, and uh, all kinds of yippee ki yay uh, <laughs> affiliated things. And then in 80, 88, 89, I think suddenly we needed to, there was this feeling of being immersed in this uh, whole theater thing of uh, cowboy hats and spurs and dusters and uh, this whole theater thing going on. Yeah. And suddenly uh, we got popular quick, toured Scandinavia, toured uh, 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 Benelux. It was like, are we gonna stay 24 hours a day in this cowboy costume? Is this is this us? And uh, so we very quickly, you know, turned into you could say uh, just hard bastard blues. That was what yeah. uh, we turned. We, I mean, for, on, on our third album, it was more bastard blues than uh, actually uh, Americana or or, or cow punk. Yeah. So and that, talking that, 1989. I mean, yeah. talking no no fuel left for the exactly pilgrims. exactly. That must have changed both GAD and your life as well. Definitely, but our lives changed. Uh, around there because suddenly we were touring around Scandinavia and, and Europe, uh, promiscuous rock and roll touring, and suddenly coming home to some kind of uh, aftermath, some kind of hangover. And, and suddenly, it you know, know, when hangovers kind of merge with existentialism. Oh, is this my life? Oh, am I good enough? Oh, am I a true artist? I don't know. That was how we felt. At, at least we were 20, 19, 20 years old. We need to make something that's true to ourselves. We need something that that takes in both Ramones, but also Thin Lizzy, yeah. both Gun Club, but also ACDC. We need to make stuff that is you're really us, true to us. So that was what we started. That kind of melting pot. 
But the influences at that time were those, I mean, for you as a songwriter as well, were those, we're talking Thin Lizzy and those kind of bands. Definitely. We, we totally into, uh, uh, totally into 70s uh, rock before uh, punk rock, hit, punk rock hit, hit us. Yeah. And um, I'd say that uh, that whole thing, that, that swagger, that, that has been a, a, yeah, the blues has just been a big part of DAD always. Yeah. And of course the blues is in the country and the blues is in Americana, but we just felt okay. And then another important thing in DAD, we discovered a band from Finland called Smack. Mm. And that was like, whoa, that was like the widest, darkest, bastard blues you could ever find. It was so <laughs> true. It was like, whoa. And I bid you try to uh, YouTube or try to find some uh, songs with Smack. That's uh, that, that was like a revelation to us. Okay. So after uh, No Fuel Left the Pilgrims, you follow up the record with Risking It All mm -hmm. at 91. I mean, at, at that time, you must be living the dream. Definitely. But also, I mean, got to remember, living the dream, yes, but also knowing very, very, I mean, it was... It was it's also pressure because you, okay, you made a good album. Okay, this could be your life. Yeah. Make another album. Yeah. Give up, 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 you move just up, <laughs> up. No, make another album. So, so there was a lot of hard work in, involved as well. Yeah, oh, we'll, we'll have to get back that to that later because mm. I, I need to pick your brains on how can you write a song like, for example, Laugh and a Half. We'll take that later. I, I really need to hear how you yeah. make it. You want to hear that now? The how to make Laugh and a Half? Yeah, we can take it now. Okay. <laughs> okay, a song like Laugh and a Half started out with the whole band on it and um and i luckily i forgot how it sounded but it was not a good song everybody played and we tried to push it we tried to stay back in the end we were in the studio in the end we started to put reverb on the bass drum and when you start to put that's a trick if you when you start putting reverb on the bass drum that means you do not have a good track <laughs> but remember we were um we were in the in a thing with uh, Mr. Big was uh, da 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 all those uh, acoustic ballads, uh, uh, try, Sweet Child of Mine, whatever. There was a lot of those ballads. We were just, that's not. We never do. We never do. We're, that's too cheesy. We're not doing an acoustic ballad. <laughs> Definitely not. That's that's not punk. And then at one point we said, okay, let's try to make this with two acoustic guitars. <laughs> Let's try to make it Mr. Big. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we made Laugh and a Half with two acoustic guitars and suddenly everybody was hurt. Well, you will never get away with saying you don't play power ballads because you were in the record power ballads. We know uh, we were uh, on power ballads and that's yeah. been like, I mean, I went to my family to uh, to where the people land, people land yeah. and on the square, <laughs> I was coming totally as a civilian, and on the square there was a guy sitting there when they could, and playing laugh and half. It's yeah. like it's all over. Oh, 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 oh! Well, they still are all over. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I played it myself. Yeah. <laughs> Besides DAD and other successful bands like Volbeat, Michael Learns to Rock, Gasoline and Pretty Maids, Jesper's home country Denmark is also famous for its screaming red hot dogs called Pölse and its many brands of beer. Mm. Amazing. <laughs> I love it. Denmark is known for having one of the best beers in the world. And if you look at look at this Carlsberg beer, it says probably the best beer in the world. I have a two more as well. These are definitely the two biggest brands in Denmark. I have to try. We have to see, we have to make competition, which is the best beer. So we'll try with this one. Listen to this sound. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> okay, cheers. That is amazing. Trust me. And now we're gonna try Carlsberg. I love that sound. Isn't it the best sound? Yeah, it is. Carlsberg, cheers. It's, we're talking about two lagers here, two really good beers. This is my favorite. It said probably the best beer in the world. Ah, probably not. This one will win. So, um, 
but I mean, the, the, the process of, of making songs, I'm not talking the process of making hit songs, because mm. you probably don't know that when you start, but exactly. um, how, how, how do you start writing a song? Do you start with the lyrics? Do you start with the music? Or how do you, how do you start and write a song? Definitely. You sit and noodle with the guitar. Guitar. Yeah, we sit and noodle, every one of us, all four of us, you know, watch TV, whatever you do, have a guitar by, and then suddenly there's a little thing that intrigues you. Okay, funny. Okay, start going from that to that. That's great. Um, so we 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 think of riffs, chord prog progressions, and just making small pieces of music, bring them out here, throw them at each other, see which one sticks, and then I put a melody on top of it. And that's just how it works. And it's it's tedious. And yeah. as I mentioned before, you ha you need to at least make ten songs before there's one good song. Yeah. And. Uh, and that's of course something that you've learned over time, because when you started out, oh, everything's genius. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. But do you know? Well, I mean, you've written so many songs, you've played so many songs. Um, mm. Do you know, like, when you're done with a song, like, fuck yeah, this is a hit. You can you feel it? You do that with every song you make. You sing. This is a this is this is a great it's song because you you wouldn't finish it if you didn't have that uh, that uh, that slap. But the, the only way, and you don't know if you made it. You never know if you made it, and uh, not not at all. But there's one thing that's part of indicators. If you keep coming back to that song, for instance, in a space like this, hey, let's try this again. I'm, I found a new chord progression for the C part. Hey, let's try to uh, prolong the intro. Let's try to shorten down the intro, and you keep on. You have this feeling of. That's it, that is not a frigid piece of art, but it's like a, a thing that keeps evolving, keeps living in you. Yeah. And you enjoy playing it over and over and over and over. Then there's a pretty good chance that a lot of other people would like it as well. Yeah, well, uh, I bet that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you must have felt when you finished Sleep in My Day where you're like, this is something that's going to Yeah, but it, we, we didn't even finish it before we felt it was good. We just played the... We, we went to um, uh, Steve's parents' summer house. We brought many grams of hash, and we brought many uh, liters of uh, of Coca Cola, <laughs> as normal Coca. Yeah, 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 blah, blah. and we brought oven chicken. You know, uh, fast chicken. Ah, yeah. That was what we brought, and then our instruments, and then we played that riff. Do do do. We just played that riff all night. <laughs> Only that riff. <laughs> so you need that. <laughs> Yeah, we need the ingredients. Yeah, we needed the ingredients just to <laughs> to delve into that riff, and that's yeah. that's how good songs start. There's a, there's a riff, there's a main central riff that intrigues you, that that kind of tells you everything about yourself yeah. straight away, and then there's the work. Okay, we need to have a verse. Okay, we need to how where's what where's the chorus in this? Okay, how many choruses? How many verses? Is that B C part? Is that solo part? All that stuff is something that you you just then you start, that's 10% inspiration and then 90% work. Oh, that's amazing. For us, the 10% inspiration is enough to fulfill the artistic thing, but then, you know, ah, 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 we need to make this, you know, you to package it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, and today, I mean, it, you've been writing songs since, since uh, the 80s. Mm. Uh, when you write songs today and you, you told uh, us and the viewers that it will be a new record yeah. next year. Mm. So when you write songs today, uh, do you write them differently than what you did at the 80s? I mean, or is it more like a competition thing now? Everybody wants to be a part of it, or is it just like, ah, I have this song and everybody's like, okay, let's listen to it. How, how does it work today? Is it different? It's more or less the same. It, 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 we start out very seldom. Uh, any of us shows up with a finished song, very seldom. It's uh, Maybe there's a verse on a chorus, and then everybody throws out the chorus, makes a new chorus, or what, stuff like that happens all the time. Um, but it's basically the same, of course, because we split everything in four, regardless of who's coming with what. Okay. There's no like uh, nobody's no competition for. I need to have my song with none of that, which is very good for art. Yeah, not to have the it egos be. because there's a lot of egos in other all all, <laughs> all aspects. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> So that's great. So that's what and we've more or less done the same. We've tried at one point when Laos joined the band, he said, guys, do you know how the youth is doing? 
<laughs> the young people are not showing up in the rehearsal space Monday to Friday to write songs. They write songs at home, and then they, and then everybody, and then we only have to rehearse like a small amount. We tried, it didn't work because the, you, we need to be here to feel it. We need to be here to put in the emotions. I mean, it's it's just a riff. You have to put in emotions so that it yeah. lifts, give it wings, uh, and we need to to be together to find out where each of us is. Okay, that's also where you get stuff out for the lyrics. Yeah. Okay, where are we? Who are we? What's happening in our, in our lives? So all that stuff, you need to be here together and, and breathe each other's air, so to speak. But if you look around inside this, mm. this space, I mean, it's, it's very analog. Mm. It's not yeah, like definitely. computers everywhere, which many studios have. Yeah. So, for example, I know that many rock bands today, they, as you say, they sit mm. at home. They, mm. yeah. uh, they make all the kind of music, drums, everything. On a computer, yeah. and then when they're finished, they go and tell the drummer, make it like this. Exactly. But so let's say you come up with a riff, you go yeah. here, drums, we'll play the drums, and yeah. not on a computer. Exactly. Exactly. This is very that's old fashioned. That's fucking rock and roll, man. It's very old fashioned, and that's yeah. the way it, it has to be this way because that's the way it works. Because yeah. you need to keep, we need to follow each other into new territory. Because if someone like goes ahead, I made a, a jazz funk. Uh, <laughs> What? But if we go for jazz funk feel together here, it it could become magic. It could become perfect music. Yeah. But if once you know uh, runs off with some kind of stupid idea, uh, the three of us wouldn't never follow. So it's very important to follow, feel the emotions in what's being said and, and does it work. And I can tell you, you can come with the come out here with the per most perfect riff and the souffle t totally falls together when you yeah, when you put it okay so that was another one of my hot air dreams that, <laughs> that just went down the drain yeah. but then something else that something that you really didn't think was something turns out to be you never know yeah so we're talking approximately 10 songs on an album right yeah for, for the time being i think that that's perfect for rock maybe 12 but yeah 12. and um, so how many how many songs do you choose from when you when you pick the ten songs, see that's uh, that's a funny thing because total finished songs on 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 you know on on the level of de on de of demos, not totally finished lyrics, not totally uh, speeds and classic. Then I'd say we'll at least be thirty songs. Thirty. Yeah, but before that, we've discarded many songs here. Songs that were verse, chorus, verse, bridge, chorus, verse, uh, chorus, um, middle eight. Things that we've been working on, we've discarded f from here. So, f at least fifty songs, which is, it's very hard to start from scratch, knowing that you need <laughs> to make fifty songs. But it, I mean, that I mean, isn't that a difference as well when it comes to to hard rock or heavy metal or whatever. When when you talk, to, because a lot of music making today mm. is about making singles mm. it's every it talk spotify and all those things mm. it's always a single singles but hard rock and rock is still making an album yeah. and um, so when you write the songs and when you choose the songs do you think of them like this will be song number one this will be number two number three etc etc yeah uh, uh, not like not that detailed but yes if there's one song that needs to be on the album and there's a, a cousin or a sister with the same kind of uh, yes these two fit together, kind of thing, yeah. and 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 this is maybe a, a perfect eighth eighth track on 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 the album. Yeah, there's a little bit of, of that. It is try to make something coherent and try to make something uh, songs that you know fit together as as, but also tells the story of where we are right now. As a band. Yeah. Well, trust me, we look forward to the new record. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> so the first single will be released. Good question. Maybe, well, we, we maybe need an exact date. So don't you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, in the start of the year, we'll, uh, we'll I think we'll drip out uh, two or three singles uh, in the start of uh, around spring. Go for starting from you know, hmm. early uh, late winter. Late winter. Yeah, that's that, that's that's the hope. Okay, so fourteenth yeah. of November. That's that's early winter. <laughs> it depends on where you are. <laughs> So let's let's move from from this studio to touring yeah. all over the world. Yeah. Um, do you remember when you started touring the first like big tour or first big gig? And we're not talking 
like you know a pub or something do you remember what, what the first game with jd was no i remember i can i can tell you stories that i remember but i can kind of i don't know anything about which year and why and how did we get there there's none of that i can remember one of the first concerts in sweden was at modern museum oh Bef and that was like on the first maxi single so we only had up, up, over the mountain top, and Marlboro Man. <laughs> and that was, uh, yeah, that was definitely art. That it fitted perfectly into Modern Museum because yeah. that was like expressive art. Um, we played Errols, we played uh, in Göteborg. You know Errols in the old? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember shit other than that. <laughs> I mean, we played Roskill Festival, 88. 88. 1991, 92, 94, 95. Oh, you were much we, like a house band on Roskilde. We've played the Orange, the Orange stage at least 11 times, as yeah. my memory serves me. Well, that's <laughs> that must have been yeah. <laughs> quite quite nice. Yeah, yeah. So what's the difference between touring in the 80s and 90s and touring today? The biggest difference? I mean, maybe we were, it felt like we were a little bit part of a pioneer movement in terms of touring at that point, but it was still going from the 70s into something more professional. So, so doing it in the 80s were a little, little bit like paving while you it drove in in the sense. But also, it was um, a, for me very quickly. It turned into be okay. This is serious stuff. So yeah. I quit uh, drinking when we were touring. Uh, all yeah. 89, 88, 89. I just couldn't sing if I had been partying last uh, the day before. Yeah. So for me, I was very quickly into okay. This is serious stuff. This is what I want to do the rest of my life. I love this so much that I want to take care of you know the inner core of this. Um, so the whole monkey business <laughs> were before that. Okay. Were the first two country punk uh, albums. Yeah, and then, soon, so the bad craziness was actually before bad craziness. Exactly. The bad craziness we were uh, singing about was the bad craziness we had experienced. Ah, okay. Yeah, because that, that's also one of my mm. questions. I mean, you have an amazing voice. You have like the rock voice and had for, for a long time. <laughs> you know it yourself. <laughs> You've said it to me yourself. Okay, I did. I, oh, yeah. That was, I had yeah. my head on my own. But, uh, yeah. So. Uh, and you still have, and that's mm. is such a fun thing. Because I mean, being in this business, hearing bands from the eighties, with with you know singers that can't sing anymore, yeah. um, do you think that you have something? I mean, have you have you treated your voice in a special way to still keep it in this perfect you know sound as it has today? It's a good question. I have a long, uh, boring answer, but you'll get it anyway. Yeah, as thank follows. You. Thank you. As follows. <laughs> Remember that we started out, and there was ambition on our part that we should be a big arena band, a worldwide arena band. Those ambitions luckily didn't happen. It didn't happen. We we are we, we were a theater band all over the world. If we you were supposed to play for 30,000 people on a Thursday and next day for 30,000 people on a Friday and so on and so forth, there would be so much panic and so much money invested in what you were doing that you would immediately get some of those shots the hormone shots yeah and when you get the hormone shots oh you sing like a dream but the day after you really need a hormone shot mm. and then you sing like a dream and you make the money for the for the for the man but next day you really need a hormone shot <laughs> to sing and to make the money for the man yeah luckily we got out of that um, that whole thing in that sense, that uh, it was much more hum humane. The DAD has DAD's career is long because it's been humane. It has never been totally skyrocketing. Yeah. So that's one of the things. The things. Another thing is, I very quickly learned I couldn't drink while touring. Yeah. Not because the alcohol in itself, but when you after a gig starts drinking, then you're so full of yourself that you need to tell everybody a loud joke. <laughs> and that goes on in well into the morning. <laughs> if you tell loud jokes every year, night and morning, yeah. your voice is gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you quit drinking and you yeah. quit 
doing a loud job. Yeah, you know, in bars and, uh, and discos. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you have performed for millions of people yeah. since since the 80s. Yeah. Uh, I read, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the the probably the biggest arena or the biggest gig you played was for like 120, 130,000 people. Yeah, that was in Germany. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. How does it feel? Try to explain for me and to the viewers, yeah. how does it feel to get up on stage and there is like a small city in front of you yeah. where everybody is shouting your name? Yeah. And I mean, how do you even, mm -hmm. how, how do you cope with that? It's, um, there is actually a boring but a true answer. And that is, you just, you have to focus on the work. You have to focus to hit the nose, notes, remember the lyrics, remember the chords. And that's what happens all the time when you play live. It's very seldom that you can totally let go and enjoy the adoration and, and, and enjoy the applause and enjoy and just float away into it because when you put something into it, you get much more out of it and, and, and it, you get more, much, much more fulfillment if you let go of that and just, <laughs> look at me, look at me, <laughs> suddenly <laughs> everything yeah. disappears. Yeah. So it's, it's really just doing the work. And so that's one of the reasons we're here. If you enjoy this, working hard here, trying to figure out how a riff can sound good, that's like the inner core of my existence, and if I really like the, if I really like to work on the inner core, then everything is a bonus, and everything's beautiful. So when we know what to do, it could be a hundred people, a hundred twenty thousand people. It's like just put in what you do, and that's fulfilling in itself, so to speak. Of course, you drink the adoration mm, in small yeah. in small um, amounts, and of course you, you just oh how great! But I remember I could so vividly remember when we you know um in the 90s where things were like okay going a little down i was going down to talking to the t-shirt girl how many t-shirts did we sell today i was looking for feedback okay yeah. hey, how many money how many people how many i was like hey 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 totally wrong turn it around what was that was that the ego talking yeah that was ego talking yeah you turn it around give only give. Don't think that you should harvest anything. Just give. And that's like one of the ma main reasons for, for, for the longevity of DAD is, hey, we're giving. And, yeah. and the rest is bonus. And that's, that's what you are very well known of in the mm. industry of music. Mm. Uh, everybody loves you. Mm. I've talked to a lot of people and I've been to many concerts uh, with DAD and with, with you as a solo artist as well. I, I don't think I've heard any bad things about you at all. I uh, haven't to be, I mean, can you give us some little shit that must have happened? Oh, there's a loads of shit, but... but the, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, gonna have, uh, we're gonna have a section later in the interview, <laughs> which is called How Much Rockstar is Jesper Binson. Exactly. So and, uh, we'll come to that maybe yeah, then. That'll so, be the boring yeah. shit. <laughs> I can tell you that when we started out, it was like everybody was saying, okay, Bands disappears, managers and booking agents and record companies will stay forever. And that's like the power houses of your career and your life. Yeah. Everything is the upside down. It turned out that the band, that DAD, was here forever. And managers, bookers, agents, record company guys, record AR men, all those disappears. So of course there's been funny situations where people have left us. We thought that we were being discarded and yeah. thrown out after a couple of years. It turned out that we were the center of our own mm. career. And, 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 and people are, keep coming and you know, can we work with you? Can we do something? Hey, let, let's, uh, and that's, it's just, it's a miracle that, it, that that thing's turned around. But of course, in that, that whole process of saying goodbye to close partners, that whole process of saying goodbye to people that you've worked closely with, yeah. And just and us taking on and take going off or and still fueling the rocket to reach for the stars. That has been like that's the only asshole part of DAD that we've left people behind. We thought that we were gonna we were told we were gonna be left yeah. behind, <laughs> and then it was the other way around. Was the other way, yeah. Mm. Well, that's that's part of the machinery, I guess. Mm, yeah. um, so we're talking about, about touring and all those things. You you said you were not an arena band, but still you played like the biggest venues and everything. Mm, yeah. Um, 
do, do you have like a special memory from like well this gig at a certain point was like still the funniest that ever happened and not the, not the kind of stories that you want oh. I, re I only remember when we played for 90 no we played for 39 people in Graz <laughs> in Belgium yeah 39 39 people oh, that's like a big family that was like uh, that was so uh, you start off Oh, we're so embarrassed. Oh shit, what happened? Oh, who's the problem? Oh, we don't, don't, can we cancel? Oh shit. And then suddenly we turned it around and of course we went into the audience and played with everyone there. And so that's the gig you remember. All those, yeah, of course, of the, course. All the failures, you, you remember those much more than, because successes is, that's a funny thing because you don't really get anything out of it. Money, but that's it. The money are gone, you know, six months later anyway. So it's it's the, the the places where you you really had to, okay. Reach out of yourself. Okay, how do we manage this situation? And then that turned into turning that into a victory to a win. That stuff that the, you can use. That's a, something that you, yeah. That's just that's just lovely. Of course, playing Roskilde the first couple of times. I mean, we weren't even in our own bodies. Yeah. yeah, that how that was how nervous we were. Yeah. Uh, uh, so so it wasn't really a good experience in that sense. It was a good tick. Oh, Daddy played Roskilde, yeah. but it was not like in the now. It wasn't like like uh, whoa paradise. I mean, touring as much as you have done, I, a lot of people that will meet you or the other guys from the band will get starstruck today. They will be like, "Holy mm. shit, this is the idea we just mm. Um Do you have you have you? I mean, of course you met some of your idols or everything. Mm. But have, have you? Have you been starstruck, or do you still get starstruck today when you meet other artists or bands or celebrities or whatever? Because I mean, you yeah. meet a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do because, but that it's mostly on the, the level of deep respect, so to speak. It's not like star, blah, 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 but that was that's been a couple of times. For instance, we played uh, Mannheim, Stuttgart. We played Stuttgart, and then we sat in the lobby. I had a, 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 an after-show drink, and suddenly. Into the lobby <laughs> comes <laughs> Bob Dylan. Oh shit! With a hoodie and the nose, mm. and my brother, who's like totally cold assed towards any of that shit, he was like, huh? <laughs> "It's Bob! It's Bob!" <laughs> and then Bob went past the reception, past us, turned to the elevator, went into the elevator. And disappeared. Mm -hmm. That was like the sighting of a, of a thousand years. That was the <laughs> millennium sighting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's funny. I mean, that's yeah. that's of course a huge artist. Yeah. It is. <laughs> that's, that's, um, that's, and he doesn't say anything. So I mean, no, 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 he no. He wouldn't stop and say hi to you anyway. No, 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 no. <laughs> then we went. There was another uh, a, a beautiful experience we had. We went. We were in LA. We tried. We were doing soft dogs. Rehearsing, recording some demos for Soft Dogs, and um, we got invited by uh, uh, one of our roadies uh, to come out to watch uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers uh, production rehearsal. Wow! So that was out in LA Lagos' old uh, training ground. Uh, uh, so it was, it was a, a large basketball place with no people, just just the production rehearsal. The lights up and the, the sounds before they went on tour. And that was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And, we, and, then, and then our mutual friend introduced us and uh, uh, said, no, he didn't introduce us at that point. Yes, come, set, sit down. So we saw the first set. And then in between sets with the with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, they went, came down to us like, hey, he's my Danish friends, this guy. Our mutual friend. The Danish band, the, the, the Danish friends. I, oh. And Tom Petty, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Mike came along. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then they lit up a joint. And then they pass the joint around, and then everybody, like, okay, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're Denmark, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, breakfast in Denmark. <laughs> yeah. And then Tom Petty said, when the joint had been one, gone around one time, he said, be careful, it's strong. Mm. And then, was it? Kachung! <laughs> <laughs> And, and then you saw the second set, but you don't remember uh, it. Uh, uh, so uh, Jacob and Laos, they were um, they were supposed to go to a secret gig with Prince. So they were driving thirty miles, uh, twenty miles an hour through downtown Los Angeles. Whoa, whoa! We need to get to this Prince gig. Whoa, whoa! 
and I was um, and I was uh, uh, hanging at the uh, uh, at the place, and I saw the second set alone, and I was, I mean. I was so high out of my mind, but that was it was that perfect experience because they were high as well. So it was like, <laughs> yes, this is the environment in which we enjoy trumpeting the heartbreakers. So that was a tremendous respect. It was not like I lost, you know, my jaw in that sense. There was no. just total respect meeting trumpeter. Touring, being a rock star, touring, touring in the eighties, nineties, and touring today. Mm -hmm. Um, there is something called a rider, mm -hmm. uh, and for the viewers who don't know what it is, it's kind of, oh, explain what a rider is. That's like something you, next to the contract. The contract is about the money and the venue and uh, um, uh, lights and uh, uh, sound. The rider is like uh, what we as a band want in our backstage room. So that could be typical, typical, lots of water, lots of beer, lots of uh, uh, booze and chips and whatever. So that's like a, no, a very normal thing. The rider is like something, uh, the, the, the extras, so to speak. So if I book a DAD today, or if I book DAD in 1990, is the rider similar? No, nope, it's very different. <laughs> <laughs> in what sense? <laughs> um, in the old days, there would always be two bottles of vodka and uh, um, red wine and white wine and a lot of beers. Now, We've got carrot juice, grapefruit juice, um, of course orange juice and apple juice, and loads and loads and loads of water. And then in the old days you had uh, chips and candy. No candy now. Okay. No candy. <laughs> so whenever we get to a venue and there's no candy, we talk to the local people and say, why is there no candy in our backstage room? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, it's changed a bit. Yeah, it changed yeah. from being, you know, the things that you added vodka to exactly. uh, in the 90s yeah, and yeah, now yeah. to only having And it's such a funny thing because I started out as me not drinking. I was doing this thing about, and it started as a joke with carrot juice. And yeah. it was like, what? That's the most unrock. <laughs> and now we have to have double of car uh, carrot juice because everybody drinks my carrot juice. <laughs> Well, this is so fun, yeah. especially when you talk to people that's been around for some yeah. time, because yeah. everybody says the same. I, I talked to Miles Kennedy from Old Bridge. He yeah. told me yeah. he has to have broccoli yeah. in his rider. I was like, yeah. you shouldn't say that out loud. I mean, that, <laughs> that's as far as being a rock star you can come. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so, so touring and being a band for such a long time, uh, the three of you have been in the band forever. 40 years. Yeah. Uh, do you get tired of each other? Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> Whoa! I mean, you have your brother in the band. Uh, that's even yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, it's very very. Um, but if if you look at it as a social experiment, you look at it as something that needs to evolve. You need to look at it as it's. I cannot change anybody else. I can only change myself. That yeah. that's that, that's a circle you go. Idiots, motherfucking idiots! You are ruining everybody's. Ca okay, it's me. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and that circle, everybody takes that circle, and of course, this circle goes. I mean, we're not going, we're not on the same track, but everybody, it's, it's a social experiment. What we need, what the lucky thing, which is the thing that's like, I mean, which is, yeah, that's the blessing, is that we can still make music together. And yeah. we, if we couldn't do that, that would be, I mean, that's our, that's why we meet. That's this, this is the, this is the language in which we speak. This is the language in, in, uh, that we need to, and, and going on stage, shoulder to shoulder, we know we got our, uh, each other's back in that sense. But if we go like this, idiot. Then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very funny. <laughs> but I mean, being on the stage, mm. even if it's 1,000 or if it's 120,000 people yeah, standing yeah. in front of you, can you still be on stage? Can you enjoy it? Do you, do you, can you still be there and like, Holy shit! This is my job. I'm a fucking rock star. Yeah, yeah, or, definitely. or is it just you know a job? It's never just a job. I tried many times. You know, you've got a fever, you're cold, you're whatever, and you're not you know up to par. Then um, it takes at the very at the lowest, lowest of lowest. It takes three songs to get in in shape and and to be grateful and to be yes, this is my life. 
Yeah. But it happens all the time. That must o be amazing. Yeah, often it takes, you know, the first call. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it, if you can wait with the anxiousness and the nervousness until you go on stage, that gives such a boost, that gives such a kick in the ass when you go on stage and that, oh, okay, yes! <laughs> and that's, um, yeah, and the blessing is, the miracle is that I love, we love the core of what we do so much. Yeah, well, you can see that when you're on stage mm. as well. Yeah. It, it's um, <laughs> it's amazing, definitely. Mm. Um, so making a set list when you go on tour. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot of songs yeah. from, as you said, almost 40 years. Mm. How do you do it? Is it is like war between the, you know, in the band, like, I want this song, I want this, or... Or how do you how do you even no? There's always <laughs> the, the whole the blame shifting. There's <laughs> there's always one on the side of the audience. No, we need to play this and this and this. But it's never the same guy that's on the audience side. Okay. So so <laughs> then suddenly the next tour it's it's, it's loud. It's, but we need to play left and have needs after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we cannot play the same old shit. And so the, the, this whole thing shifts. But in the end, it turned out just like a Bob Dylan concert. The last four songs is. Um, audience favorites, yeah. and we've got our freedom in, in the middle. So we we try to mix it up so that we've got at least three songs that no one wanted, but we wanted. Okay. Because so that shapes up, it gives you, okay, the edge, it gives you, okay, okay, now we need to. And it, when we had like our 30th anniversary, we yeah. did a tour, uh, a club tour, 30 club tours in Denmark, just to, to uh, celebrate. Wow. Uh, 30 gigs in a row in small clubs, you know, and <laughs> on, uh, you know, nobody knew and suddenly, whoa, yes, they're here and on the <laughs> local radio. We played, so we, ne we didn't play Sleep My Day Away, we didn't play Laugh and Half, we didn't play Bad Craziness, we didn't play I Won't Cut My Hair, we, there was a, all the, the hits, that we didn't play Grow Up Pay, we played songs that people didn't want to hear. <laughs> and the funny thing is that it took, yeah, we, Actually, when we started out, we were more or less, it was a, the same storytelling dramatic curve. It was totally a DAD concert, and everybody was totally happy, apart from the couple of rednecks there. <laughs> but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> who cares? You had fun on stage. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. So, which is the funniest song to play on stage? Which is a song that you. I read that Tina Turner said that mm. when she plays the best, sing mm. for the best, mm. in the chorus, she has an orgasm every time. Whoa. So which, I, uh, which song of D.A.D. Yeah. gives you the orgasm? Woo! <laughs> That's a very good question. So what what it would be, what's the true answer to that? What's the fucking true answer to that? <laughs> hmm. Oh shit, because that changes. I mean, it changes. I can see in your eyes now that you have something coming. The, the thing is, but that's <laughs> typical me. I'm going to say something that doesn't relate to anything at all. But I, it's just been me being honest. When I talked about this 30, 30, 30 tour, yeah. 30 dates, 30 years, 30 hits on a, a vinyl. Um, we started out with a song called Rin Tin Tin, which is a song that's never been released, but it's one of the oldest DAD songs ever. And it's just mm. one riff. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. We started every show out with the backs, with our backs to the audience, and only did, did um, the, the, only played with dynamics. The same riff, totally up, totally down. <laughs> <laughs> so the well, the simplest form of bastard blues. Yeah. I would, it was just goosebumps every night. Ah. Yes. Because that's like that's our that's as I told you earlier, that's that's why we that's why we are we're totally totally fine with just that. But yeah. you cannot really com communicate. That well, we stood by our backs to the on yeah. doing that. <laughs> so that was the first song, and it was like I just that's perfect because it's so simple, it's so primal. So that's your orgasm song. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's amazing. And it's uh, yeah. it's. <laughs> I can look forward to hearing it live. <laughs> 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 uh, of course.
course, so we have to when we look at this um, this studio, and we see the old uh, posters and yeah. everything. Of course, we see the poster of when you were called Disneyland after dark. Yeah. <laughs> when and how did it happen? I mean, obviously Disney got pissed off. Yeah. You can't use our name. Mm. Uh, what happened? We, it was our third album and suddenly everybody was interested in us. There was an album with Jihad and Slima there where you know, No Fuel Left for the Pilgrims. And it was like, um, suddenly there was like a bidding war. People flew to Denmark, watched it at the Roskilde Festival, went to small clubs in the outskirts of Denmark and, and watched us. And it was like a, a, a bidding war that ended with us signing with Warner Bros. Uh, for, the third, for the third album, which would then be the first international album. They share more or less lunch places with the Disney, Walt Disney Company. So yeah. as soon as they were like, listen, we got this great. They're going to be as big as Guns N' Roses. And they're called Disney. Like, Isn't that funny that they're called Disney? Aren't you? Stop. <laughs> 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 the curtains just yeah, boom. <laughs> yeah. And I understand in that sense. Um, and you cannot make money on another man's name, brand name. It's perfect, but it was such a drag. Such a disappointment to have this funny, what do you call it, alternative uh, uh, underground punk name, as it's we thought it was, name. yeah, and then turned into DAD. And the thing is that all rock bands, when in, um, when they consist of four to five uh, young boys, is more or less made in rebellion against their fathers. <laughs> so if you end up with a band name saying dad. <laughs> it's like, f fuck, the irony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so, but was, was, it, was it an easy choice for you to just remove Disney from the band name? It was uh, definitely not, but there, but there was no way, no way out, no way back. There was just, we just had to do, just keep on uh, telling people this is the abbreviation. It, uh, that's just how it is. And that's how we... Do you uh, remember how much Disney said you're going to have to pay? No, they just said that we, you will be living on a minimum of existence the rest of your life. <laughs> 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 well, they, I would like to write the cover with someone sometime. Like. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, we... And I can tell this, there's a, there's a thing going on called numerology, where, at you have, where letters have certain value, and you have to make a name with a value that fits with your star sign or your blood type, or whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but I can tell you this much. Because over the years, over our career, we've put on this line after dark in various uh, funny ways, you know, prov prov provocative ways, just to, and every time we released anything, that spells out Disney After Dark, it's been much more of a success than DAD. So there's something about having your right name, and there's something about the t-shirts that says Disney After Dark, yeah. sells more than the one that says DAD. Yeah, well, I stole my I stole t-shirts from my big brother yeah. that said Disneyland After Dark. <laughs> <laughs> He's five years older than yeah. me, so I was like, hmm, I'll mm. this one. <laughs> okay, well, it's... It's an honor and it's mm. it's amazing to talk to you. But we have to get a tour of yep. the studio. Definitely. I'll show you everything about this. Yeah.